We're now going to continue with establishing more properties of continuous functions. And uh, before discussing these, let's uh, recall a couple of facts that we established in um, Advanced Calculus 1. Uh, I'm going to prove one of them, and the second one I'm just going to refer to the theory. Uh, so number one, Uh, let's uh, try to remember uh, boltzano weierstrass theorem. Takes me a while to write boltzano weierstrass uh, And... Um, the statement of his theorem was really simple. It says that uh, any bounded sequence uh, always contains a convergent subsequence. So that is a fact number one. And the fact number two, uh, is the following theorem. So this would be fact A that I want to recall. And then the fact B is going to be the following theorem. Uh, suppose that um, AB is a closed interval and SN Uh, a, sub a sequence that is completely contained inside AB that the sequence converges to some number as zero. Then a zero must belong to AB. Uh, and we can uh, do a really quick proof of this. So the proof. Uh, we're going to use a contradiction. So let's suppose S0 does not belong to AB. Uh, then we have two choices. Uh, either S0 is less than A, or S0 is greater than, than B. Uh, so we can suppose without loss of generality uh, that S0 is bigger than B. And, uh, Whatever we do in this case can be uh, repeated with like really small modification when S0 is less than A. Uh, so S0 is greater than B. So then, uh, because uh, Sn converges to a 0, uh, recall the definition of a sequence uh, of uh, the limit of the sequence. If Sn converges to a zero, then for any epsilon there exists a capital N, such that if n is bigger than capital N, then the difference between Sn and S0 is less than epsilon. Uh, so in particular, I can use uh, I can use epsilon that is equal to uh, half of the distance between S0 and B. So 
because Sn is going to be convergent to S0, uh, there exists Uh, there exists an N in R such that Sn minus S0 is less than, and again, I'm choosing as my absolute half of a distance between S0 and B. S0 is bigger than B, so it would be S0 minus B uh, divided or by 2, and this is going to be true if n is bigger than capital N. Fine, so if that is the case, then we have that uh, minus S0 minus B divided by 2 is less than Sn minus S0 less than S0 minus B over 2 if we eliminate the absolute value sign, and again, this is true if n is bigger than capital N. And then if I add uh, S0 to all three sides, we're going to get uh, the following set of inequalities. So uh, S0 uh, minus S0 minus B over 2 less than Sn minus S0 plus S0, that's just Sn, uh, less than S0 minus B over 2 plus S0. Once again, if N is bigger than capital N. And I'm going to concentrate only on the first of these inequalities. So therefore, uh, S0 minus S0 minus B over 2, if I simplify that, this will be S0 plus B over 2 less than Sn if N is bigger than capital N, right? Because B changes sign, and then 2S0 minus S0 gives me S0. Uh, but also, I know that S0 is bigger than B. And so from that second inequality, I can continue it to write this as bigger than b plus b over 2, right? Again, S0 is assumed to be bigger than b, which is equal to b. And uh, thus, this means that uh, when n is bigger than capital N, b is less than Sn if n is bigger than capital N. Uh, that is, if Sn is bigger than capital B, Sn does not belong to the interval from A to B, if n is bigger than capital N, and that's a contradiction to our assumption that the entire sequence is inside the interval in A, B. So, contradiction. And we're done. All right, so now I'm going to use... Um, these two theorems that we uh, have just recalled to uh, prove the following property of continuous functions. Uh, so next theorem. Uh, is going to be something called an extreme value theorem. just extreme value. Uh, and it says the following. So if, if f is continuous on a closed 
and bound it in the roll. A, B. Uh, then F is a bounded function. And I'm going to give you a definition of a bounded function in a moment. Uh, further, F teaches its maximum and minimum values on AB. So it has both uh, the maximum and the minimum on AB. All right, so what does it mean for the function to be bounded? So here, F is bounded on a set S if there exists a number capital M in R plus. Remember that R plus is a set of all uh, non-negative real numbers uh, such that absolute value of f of x is less or equal to m for all x in S. Right, so a function is going to be bounded on its domain as long as um, its values are uh, bounded uh, by themselves, right? So I consider all values of f, then they form a bounded uh, set. All right, so let's try to prove this. So we need to prove two facts. Fact number one, f is a bounded function. Uh, or I can just write it like this, f is bounded on AB. This is just a short wave of a uh, short way of writing that f is a bounded function on the interval a, b. Uh, all right, so, well, let's use a contradiction again. Suppose not. Then, um, for any... n in capital N, right? So for any uh, positive integer, uh, n is not a bound on f of x where x is in a, b. Now, what does it mean that um, uh, a number is not a bound? So that means that there exists uh, a number I'm going to call xn in a, b, such that 
f of xn is going to be greater than n. Right? Because otherwise, if such a number did not exist, then f of x on a, b uh, will be less or equal to this n, and that will say that function f is bounded, and we assume that it's not. All right, so we have this. And so now uh, we obtain in this way a sequence xn of numbers xn that belongs to, that is a subset of the closed interval ab. So as xn is a sequence contained in AB. Uh, now, a priori, I know nothing about this sequence. It can be a sequence of totally random numbers inside AB, so the sequence by itself does not have to converge at all. It might uh, oscillate between A and B or whatever. Uh, we don't know. We know nothing about this sequence. Uh, well, but we do know one thing, that it is completely contained inside the interval from A to B. So therefore, the sequence Xn is bounded. Right? It's just a sequence of numbers which are greater or equal than A, so they're bounded from below. And they're less or equal than b, so they're bounded from above, so the sequence xn is just bound. And because it is bounded by bolzano weierstrass theorem that we just recalled, if I have a bounded sequence, it must contain a convergent subsequence. So there exists... Oops, a subsequence x n k uh, that converges to some x zero. Right. So if I look at the sequence x n k, that sequence converges to some number x zero. Uh, well, but also uh, uh, x and k is uh, contained in AB, right? Sequence xn was contained in AB, so then its subsequence also is contained in AB. So that means uh, that, uh, in fact, I have a sequence which is contained, a subsequence which is contained uh, in AB, it converges to X0. So by the second theorem that I proved over here, if I have a sequence inside a closed interval and that sequence converges, then its limit must belong to the interval. So I'm going to use that fact here. So therefore, x0 belongs to AB by the previous theorem. All right. Uh, well, but then uh, next implication. Uh, what do I know about the function f of x? f is assumed to be continuous on a closed and bounded interval from a to b, so therefore f is continuous at x0 in particular. Right? And if f is continuous at x0, then by definition of continuity, Uh, sequential definition of continuity, 
Uh, because x and k converges to x0, then it follows that, so because uh, the limit as k goes to infinity of x and k is equal to x0, uh, we have Uh, that the limit as k goes to infinity of f of x and k, this must be f of x0. All right. Okay, so that that's fine. That's not really very interesting. Uh, now, also, my function is defined everywhere on a, b, so then in particular, f must be defined at x0. So f of x0 is some real number, right? Because, or since, uh, f is defined at x0. Okay, so this is not very spectacular so far. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, what else do we know? The way we defined a sequence xn was that we chose xn in such a way so that f of xn is uh, going to be greater than n. Uh, so if I look at the subsequence xn k, it is a subsequence of xn. So if I take f of xn k, this must be greater than nk, right? Uh, now, what do we know? We know that, and nk what is the limit of nk? Uh, well, an nk is a subsequence of n and n goes to infinity. So any subsequence of a, a sequence converged to infinity also must go to infinity. So a limit of nk is infinity because it is a subsequence of a sequence n that goes to infinity. All right. All right, but then because uh, nk goes to infinity and f of x nk is bigger than nk, so we can conclude from this, so therefore, uh, limit as k goes to infinity of f x and k must be greater or equal than the limit k goes to infinity of n k, and we just said that that is equal to infinity. All right, and so now what have we got? we got this uh, dichotomy. So limit as k goes to infinity of f of x and k, on one hand, it is equal to f of x zero, that is a number in R, and a limit as k goes to infinity of f of x and k from a second argument is equal to infinity.
And that is a contradiction, right? Because this is impossible. Right? Finite number cannot be equal to infinity. And so our original assumption uh, that uh, the function was not bounded on the closed interval AB now is going to be false. So we proved part A. Uh, now, onward to the second part, uh, or part one. Uh, second part, we have to show that uh, the function f reaches both its maximum and minimum values on a, b. All right, so that is going to be part two. Okay, so uh, let's define the set Uh, S as follows. It's going to be a set of all f of x such that x is some number between a and b. Uh, well, by part one, that we just proved, S must be bounded. And if S is a bounded, uh, in fact, it's a set of numbers, right? So it's a bounded set, uh, is a bounded set of real numbers. And as a bounded set of real numbers by completeness axiom, S as a supremum and I'm going to denote this supremum by capital M. All right. So if I want to show that my function my function reaches its maximum, and then of course for minimum uh, everything we is going to work in the same way. You can just replace uh, supremum with infimum and use the same arguments. Or you can simply observe that if the function f has a supremum, has a maximum, if the function minus f has a minimum, or if a function has a minimum, then minus f has a maximum, and then uh, use the fact that we established the existence of a maximum uh, to show that the existence of the minimum. So it's enough just for all, as for all of these arguments, it's enough to establish uh, just a maximum or supremum, uh, and then an infimum and minimum will follow in uh, the same way or just by reflection. Okay, so capital M is supremum of S. I want to show that the maximum is achieved. So that means that I have to demonstrate that uh, there is a point inside the interval AB at which my function is actually equal to capital M. So uh, we want to show then that there exists a number x capital M inside AB such that f of xm is equal to capital M. Uh, how can we do that? Uh, well, let's try the following. So by default, I don't know that uh, the supremum is achievable. But I do know that if I decrease uh, my supremum by some small amount, uh, just by definition of a supremum, I should be able to find uh, a point where my function reaches a value which is going to be larger than this number, which is slightly lower than 
uh, smaller than supreme. Uh, so let's formalize what I just said in the following way. Uh, I'm going to say note that, again, for every n in capital N, uh, uh, the number m minus 1 over n is not an upper bound on uh, the set S, right? Because an upper bound on the set capital S is capital M. If I decrease capital M by 1 over n, that's not an upper bound, because capital M is the least upper bound. And so, therefore, uh, there exists uh, an Xn in AB such that f of Xn is greater than M minus 1 over n, right? So again, because capital M is a supremum, M minus 1 over n is not a supremum, S consists of all possible values of my function. So there, because M minus 1 over n is not a supremum of values of my function on the interval AB, I should be able to find at least one point where my function is larger than M minus 1 over n. All right, so then for every n such xn will exist. And so therefore, uh, we have a sequence a sequence xn which is completely contained, again, inside AB, and such that f of xn is bigger than m minus 1 over L for all n and n. Okay? All right, so we constructed a sequence like that. Uh, so xn is a sequence of numbers inside the closed interval AB by itself. It's not a convergent sequence. It's just some sequence. I know nothing about it. But because xn is inside AB, again, just like in the previous step, xn must be a bounded sequence. So then... Xn is a bounded sequence. It's bounded from above by B and from below by A. And so, therefore, once again, by Bolzano Weierstrass theorem, uh, there exists a subsequence Xnk. Uh, that converges converges to some number x0 uh, right x and k again is inside closed interval a b so the previous theorem once again uh, uh, verifies that um, x0 belongs to AB, right? So this is exactly the same uh, chain of Balsanova's choice arguments 
or the closed interval that I used in the previous step. All right, and so if x0 belongs to AB, uh, what do we know about the function f uh, at every point of AB? f is continuous at that point. So therefore, f is continuous. at x0, and if f is continuous at x0, so again, by sequential definition of continuity, uh, we can conclude, because x and k goes to x0, and f is continuous at x0, uh, then the limit as k goes to infinity of f of x and k uh, is going to be equal to f of x0. Right? Uh, so once again, x and k was a subsequence that goes to x0. x0 then belongs to the closed interval a, b because the sequence subsequence x and k and sequences xn by itself are both contained inside AB. Then x0 is in AB implies that f is continuous at x0, right? Because f is continuous at all points of AB. And because f is continuous at x0, the sequential definition of continuity allows me to stay, state this, that the limit of f of x and k must be equal to f of x zero. Uh, all right. Uh, further, how did we construct the sequence xn? We require that f of xn is bigger than m minus one over n for every n. So if I look at the subsequence, I get uh, a subsequential version of the same statement, f of x and k must be bigger than m minus 1 over nk, right? And uh, as k goes to infinity, nk goes to infinity as a subsequence of a convergent sequence n convergent to infinity. Uh, so this is true for every k, and uh, uh, therefore the limit as k goes to infinity of f of x, this was nk, uh, f of x and k, must be greater or equal than the limit k goes to infinity of m minus 1 over nk, right, by comparison uh, result for limits. And because nk goes to infinity, this limit on the right is equal to capital M. And uh, what we conclude then from this uh, the limit of f of x and k we showed is equal to f of x zero and uh, so therefore I have that f of x zero is going to be greater or equal than capital M right so from here and from here I get that f of x0 is greater or equal than m. Well, but then, on the other hand, uh, f of x0 is just one value of my function, so it belongs to the set s of all possible values of my function. And so, therefore, f of x0 must be less or equal than the supremum of s, 
and supremum of s is that number m. And so therefore, what we got is f of x0 is greater or equal than m by what we showed here, and it's less or equal than m because uh, f of x0 is a member of capital S. And so f of x0 is equal to capital M. And we're done. Right, because that was my goal, I tried to show that there exists a point inside the interval AB where f uh, is f of x0, f of x is equal to m. So we sh I showed the existence of such a point. Uh, so this is a very, really important theorem which gets used in uh, calculus a lot. Uh, next time we're going to uh, prove another important theorem, uh, something that was called an intermediate value theorem in calculus.